Because you know, we are losing time. It's going to be 3.15. Started, sir. We can start, sir. Sure. How many, madam? How many people? Deepshika, Prashanta. Three, and sir. Sabita. Three at this. sir. Okay, let's start. Otherwise, you know, timekeeping will be difficult. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, everybody. We have come to the last day of this seminar. So it has been a pleasure for Getty Intellect to conduct this program in association with the SBM. Right, and the topic for today is dispute resolution in contract management. So I have with me a panelist, Mr. Ramkumar Subramaniam, who is our Vice President for Projects and Consultancy Services. Ramkumar is an engineer from IIT Madras and from IIM Ahmedabad. He has got about 37 years experience in projects in various fields mostly in supply chain management. And I have also the observer, Mr. Sham Kumar as well, okay, who has been with us for the last uh, four sessions. So let me welcome all of you and let's start without losing any more time. Right, and what are we going to see today? What is a delay claim? Contract language related to delay. Then comes the experiential learning lessons, types of delays of the owner, contractor cost delays. Then you will be seeing types of damages, owner and contractor, liquidated damages, actual damages, then requirements for a successful claim, liability, cancellation, damages, and quantification. Okay, now <clears throat> to, for easy understanding, we are showing the learning outcomes as well. To understand the possible causes of delay in project execution, to analyze the owner's defenses and counterclaims, to analyze the contractor's defenses and counterclaims, to seek clarification for the contract clause, no damage for delay to analyze the requirement the requirements for a successful claim to comprehend excusable and non-excusable delays in a project to ascertain the final findings from delay responsibility analysis okay um, just to repeat what i had mentioned yesterday we have been talking about contract for the last five days okay and from yesterday onwards, we have been <clears throat> getting into another light subject of project management. Okay, And today you will see more of project management as well. So it's very important for you to understand and for us to teach the, <clears throat> the contract management through project management. Okay, Then it will make, then it will, you will understand in a better way and you can appreciate it in a better way. So let's see. What is a delay claim? Okay, here there are two perspectives. Okay, let's take the first perspective from the contractor, which means a request for compensation or time due to owner cost delays. That is the contractor's version of a delay. Okay, now let's look at from the owner's perspective. An assessment of liquidated damages or a claim for actual damages due to contractor cost delays. Okay. We will you will see more and more about liquidated damages, okay, contractor cost delays and all that as we go along. So I will not I will I will refrain from giving more uh, explaining these things at this juncture. Okay. Now let's look at the contract language. Okay. <clears throat> I'll invite now our panelist Ram Kumar to explain on the contract language. He's a specialist in this field. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. 
So, uh, so while we are talking about contracts, there are standard terminologies which is used, and uh, I think this uh, this session will be to acquaint you on the basics of this as well as claim resolution. So, as you've already gone through the basic sessions, I think uh, the ones which are general, I'm sure you can easily understand. The ones which are more pertaining to disputes, I'll explain claims. I'll be dealing with more in detail. So as everyone knows, time is of the essence. So any contract has a service level agreement, which says that certain jobs have to be completed in a certain time frame. So, and since time is also money, we need the contractor has to ensure that the job is completed in that time. Now that it could be a project, it could be a product, it could be a service. But time is of the essence. So uh, the exact time required for completing this should will always be considered while uh, framing the agreement and the productivity norms and other things would be considered while fixing the time. So that is the contract time for completion. So the productivity norms are generally fixed that there is a continuous improvement year after year. So typically people look for a 5% improvement in productivity year on year. And then there could be a quantum jump in productivity with automation. So all these aspects would be considered while fixing the timing. The other thing uh, which is mentioned is on the milestones. Now, uh, typically large projects, which are construction projects, have certain milestones. Uh, like, you know, first the site survey, then you have the design completion, then you have the uh, you know the, no, uh, the the actual soil testing. So like that, there are various milestones which are there, and these milestones are fixed so that we can monitor the project properly. So if there is a large project, it is better to break it down in phases, and it is also important that we can do certain activities simultaneously. Certain activities can be done only after the completion of the earlier activity. But certain other set of activities can be done simultaneously. So all these would be considered while framing the contract milestones. You would be familiar with per charts. I think we would be dealing with a case study which will have that detail. So everywhere we would be having contract milestones and these milestones are monitored for completion of the contract. Now, claims may not be there as such on individual uh, I mean, typically the claims are for the entire contract. So these claims have to be considered individually, not for, I mean, for each milestone. So that is the idea of monitoring the milestone. So that is the specifications in the CPM or the bar chart, which is the critical path method, where the certain set of activities form part of the critical path method. And if they are delayed, the project is delayed. Whereas other activities which can be done in parallel, there is an allowance for delay, which may not delay the project. So uh, this would be, I think uh, many of you who are doing, uh, the, I think uh, this would be the basic which you would be familiar with, but we would be also having a case study to explain the bar chart and also the claims based on that. So the notice provisions are that see every basically we are dealing with a contract which is a legal document so if there is a claim there has to be a notice given and the claim exactly has to be mentioned and uh, you know the reply sought in a certain time frame and similarly a reply would also be given so there there would be certain very clear procedures to uh, with notice to have a claim on either side. It could be the owner side or it could be the contractor side. Time extension requests are required in a practical sense because there could be delays due to various factors, both extraneous, which could be like, for example, if there is a pandemic like COVID, there would be a time extension request. There could be natural calamities like floods or there could be certain uh, local issues like you know port delays and other things which could cause the delays 
the other reason for the delay for any project could be that certain unplanned events may have happened so you may not have foreseen that event and that event has happened or it has not been adequately planned in the original thing and so this because of that there could be a delay which has happened so there is a obviously responsibility and cost effect analysis would be done i think this would be again be dealt with during the session on who is responsible for these delays and based on that the person who is responsible would have to foot the bill literally so it could be in terms of granting a time extension or actually making a payment depending on the terms of the contract so i think uh, liquidated damages have also already been covered uh, so th these are essentially uh, damages which are paid in lieu of the uh, you know the delay or in the uh, execution of the contract in execution of the claim of the contract and it is mutually agreed between the parties on a certain unit basis it could be based on per item of output or per day of delay so based on that the total claim is found based on the total delay so there could be certain uh, clauses where certain delays you know the no damage uh, i mean uh, clause may be there in which case basically because these delays are could be extraneous which could uh, not be under the control of the contractor so base so these delays are i mean classified some of these delays could be on the force majeure side also where i think force majeure clauses are where it is completely beyond the control of both the owner as well as the i mean the principal as well as the supplier so these delays there would be not be any damages and the next one is delays by other contractors clause so while there could be a primary contractor the other contractor would be the contractors who would be uh, uh, whose work is dependent on i mean whose work, who also coexist in the same project so if there is a electrical contractor and a civil contractor both projects both contractors are working at the same time and there could be interdependencies so if there are certain sequential activities which have to be completed by other contractors before this contractor takes it up those delays obviously will not form part of the delay and the claim process in case there is a delay and that has to be taken up by the principal with the respective contractor so the all these things are typically all these disputes claims are mentioned typically there could be an arbitration uh, clause where there is an arbitrator there could be a place of arbitration which is mentioned there is a process mentioned for uh, at, before the final uh, of course the attempt would always be in recent times to settle it either before the arbitration or at the time of arbitration before it goes to a formal legal process which actually takes much longer and which obviously would be the last resort so this sums up all these uh, things would any questions from anyone any clarifications thank you sham thank you ram uh, if yeah. i can add one more point on the notice of provisions yeah i would like to add when when communications have to be carried out with the owner okay it, or or the contractor it is essential that you have to use the right terminology okay if it is a contract violation you got to say breach of contract and then explain so like what i have been saying the take home what you should take from this course is the use of right terminology okay that is essential uh, yes i think uh, you are right uh, professor math so uh, definitely the notice while i mentioned about the need for the written notice the contents of the notice have to be clear that what is the reason for this notice what is the reason what is the clause which has been violated what is the reason for which the claim is being made and the amount of the claim so that everything is clear for which the other party has to respond 
with facts and figures so obviously when the notice is sent some facts may be uh, enclosed on uh, so just to give a supporting and documentary evidence of the claim thank you ram um just for the information of everybody let me welcome professor saroj kaul um, it thank you for gracing the occasion madam right let's move on to the owner cost delays <clears throat> shyam would you like to take over the owner cost delays yeah so so these are some uh, examples where the types of delays uh, are caused mainly because of the owner of the contract so one could be that the access to the site even though the contract has been negotiated and put in place is not available the other could be that the while the contract period or the meter has started ticking the drawings the approved drawings on which both the owner and the contractor work on are not yet ready either the civil drawings for the foundation for instance or it could be the fabrication drawings if it were given out to a fabricator another one could be as the contract progresses and if there is during the course of the contract some additional work that needs to be done which both the parties acknowledge but there is no change order in place because like we spoke earlier on day 3 and day 4 it is very essential for a change order to be in place so that the entire uh, owners of who pays for what why has the change order occurred is absolutely crystal clear and there is no ambiguity at all another owner cost delay could be because of changed conditions of work let's say for example that an activity needed to be completed in 2 months and for reasons that the organization best knows it could be that there is competition round the corner who is also building a similar product the owner wants to hasten the activity if a typical working day is on two shifts which is 16 hours and on mobilizing some number of people in those 16 hours the owner could now either increase or decrease depending on whether they want to close that specific activity quicker or later so it ends up in the specification of the working hour restrictions or enhancement of the working hours also it it cuts in both the ways another reason could be of the site condition at the time of awarding the contract or going ahead with the contract an example that comes to mind is that of the subsoil strata if one can talk of that that has been found during the soil analysis by the civil engineers and therefore they have worked the entire costing based on an excavation of a certain number of feet on which the foundation is going to be laid while working on the excavation there is a possibility that they come across a different type of soil or there is rock underneath the soil which may require more time 
different equipments which have not been conceived of during the early part or while negotiating the contract. So this itself could lead to a specific delay. There could be like we spoke of the drawing approvals. There could be some design errors that are found as a consequence of these differing site conditions or during the course of work when they have to change tack and change course. There are in some contracts also that the owner provides in the scope of work which needs to be very clear. So we come back to the contract charter that we spoke of in the first day. They clearly specify one needs to be very clear on who whose responsibility, whose accountability to provide what material, what resource between the owner and the contractor. So if in such an event that an owner has a responsibility to provide materials at frequent intervals for the contractor to work on, and if the owner is unable to do so, that would also result in an owner cost delay because the contractors, men, machinery, resources, etc., are lying idle. Right. Thank you, Shyam. You're welcome. As a logistician, I wish to add one more point on the site access. Because I've faced this very many times. It is absolutely essential that the ground in which <clears throat> work has to be carried out has to be reinforced and form, form grounding for the navigation of heavy lift equipments which will be coming to the site. So this is something which the owner has to take care of. Good, let's move to the next one. Contractor cost delays. <clears throat> Ram, are you ready to take over? Ram, are you ready to take over? Okay, Ram, so, uh, yeah. So yeah. the contractor cost, yeah. Delay. So the contractor cost delays basically. Uh, one is see there are various types of delays which can happen uh, throughout the contract. Now this particular delays ha uh, uh, are listed, which are one is in terms of getting the material and the equipment. Now depending on the contract. Now suppose if the contract is only a uh, this is a all inclusive contract which includes labor material and equipment so the contractor has to make sure that all the materials are procured and equipment is also provided on time so in case there is a delay in procuring these materials there is a contract delay and the responsibility will be on the contractor second thing would the, of course the as apart from material the next is labor so the labor is something which is uh, where the there is always a demand in certain. See the demand for variable labor. So while you know you will have typically fixed labor in terms of managerial and supervisory labor, there is a lot of variable labor which is casual in nature and also to take care of the seasonality fluctuations. Professor, looks like there is a bandwidth issue on Ram yes, Kumar. Yes, sure. Okay. <clears throat> Ram, are you okay? Are you getting back? Right, okay. Uh, in the meantime, I will just move on. When Ram is ready, please uh, come in. Lack of productivity. Okay. Now, this is again lack of productivity has to be very clearly mentioned in the contract okay i would say it should be part and parcel of the sla where things have to be made very clearly explained now <clears throat> like what ram has just mentioned 
what are the type of equipment which has to be mobilized, okay? And manpower and materials, okay? All these have to be available as and when it is required. If an additional work comes in, which has to be part and parcel of a change order, yes, then there is an additional need for mobilization, which will be an ad additional cost, okay? So having said that, so in the contract, in the SLA, the contractor I has to. Back. Sure. Are you ready, Ram? He's back. He said. Okay. Right. I yeah, was yeah, just. Yeah. So I, uh, I was just explaining. So I was on the back labor. Of productivity. Okay. Ah, uh, productivity. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You you completed. As in, sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. It's, it's okay. I'm almost done. Yeah. So, uh, shall I move to financial yeah. difficulties? Yeah, please, please, please. Yeah. So, financial is that obviously uh, the salaries and everything have to be paid on time to the contract labor. Similarly, the materials have to be procured using. So, uh, the contractor will have to fork out some working capital to run the contract. And if this working capital is not provided properly, then there would, uh, could be financial difficulties, which can result again in delayed payments and delayed uh, execution of the project, which is obviously a contractor cost delay. Other aspect is the subcontractor delay, where if I outsource the job, certain portions of the job to a contractor, another contractor, which is, uh, it could be that I have outsourced a labor contract partly, pure handling, you know, like unloading of trucks, I have one contractor and if that contractor has not provided the labor or it could be the so I have provided subcontractor for uh, you know doing a assembling activity and that person has delayed it so these are the delay would ultimately reflect on the main contractor because he has done the subcontracting and he has to take the corrective action to make sure that these delays are overcome Sequencing of the work, as we said, is very important. So, uh, you know, because the project is typically a series of activities and certain activities can be done simultaneously. So, to, so that it, they don't fall in the critical path method. So we have to make sure that activities which are uh, preparatory activities are done in such a way that the sequencing is not affected and the critical path is not affected. So it's very clear that there has to be a proper project manager who has to monitor all these activities and ensure that these things are done. The other thing is lack of productivity and rework are somewhat related. Okay, productivity is speed, whereas rework is on quality. So if I don't do a job with the proper quality, it gets rejected and I have to redo it. So that would obviously take more time. I have to make sure that I have to compensate for that time. And it, if I'm not able to compensate it with higher productivity, then again, it would get delayed. The whole project would be delayed. So essentially, the types of delays in summary would be based on resources, which could be labor, material, equipment. It could be in the productivity, the use of this equipment, and labor, and the money while the, uh, the work sequencing would come under planning part, you know. So all these aspects have to fall in place so that there are no delays caused by the contractor. Otherwise, there could be claims from the owner. Thank you, Ram. Uh, so is there any questions from anyone? Any? Right, then okay. let's move to the next one. Examples of third party cost delays. Okay, now when it comes to third parties, it can be from the government side, it can be from the local authorities, or it can be from anybody, like permit accusation, okay? Or it can be from the security, where the project is located, okay? So that is one consideration, permit accusation delays. Then adjacent contractors delay. Now, we would definitely say that the adjacent contractors Okay, should be part of the owner's responsibility because if there is a contractor who is working next to our job site and 
if we have to get permission from him for the supply of electricity or whatnot, okay? It should be the owner's responsibility to get it. Likewise, government actions and inactions, okay? Here again, the permits from the government for the labor which we have brought in from outside, outside the state, okay? Or, you know, there can be so many things which can come up all of a sudden from the government. Right, utility relocations, okay? This is again, um, Ram has already covered in that, okay? Um, when the feasibility study is provided in the beginning of, okay, before even starting the uh, tender, yes, you have narrated in the feasibility study how many <clears throat> equipments you have, what type of equipment, which year, all these details you have to give, how much is the manpower you have available, how much about, okay, details about the management, all these things you have provided. And then at the same time, you have to give also projections based on if the contract is awarded, what are the additional equipments, manpower, or managerial person you will avail for the contract and within what time frame. Okay, all these things have to be put in black and white. And it's a commitment. Right, now <clears throat> let's look at the, the type of delays. Uh, Sham, you want to take over the type of delays? Sure, sure, sir. So there are four types of delays uh, which we would uh, go over one by one. Uh, these are the excusable and non-excusable delays. So once that you can, you have an uh, explanation for, once where you there are no explanations at all. Two, compensatable and non-compensating. So for some delays, there can be no compensation that are being made on either side, either by the owner or by the uh, contractor. The third is one which is beyond the control of any one of the two parties, the owner and the contractor, which is called the force majeure delay. And the fourth and the final one is concurrent delays. They happen as the project keeps rolling out also. So if we were to move ahead and Look at these, uh, Professor, if you. Sure, thank you. Right, now let's look at, <clears throat> Ram, you want to continue? Oh, I'm sorry, Sham, you want to continue on the contractor's delayed damages? So, I, I, I'll take this one. So if the, some of the examples of contractor delayed damages that are recoverable, yeah? Like there are these field office overheads that are there. So they specify what is it on site that they would be liable or they would specify in the contract that they would get. On site supervision, they declare who are the supervisors, how many workers will they have, what would be the type of equipments, what are the utilities, etc. that they would need there. They also add into that the cost of work, which may change depending on the type of season in which they work. For instance, if they were working up north in the country, you have a summer season, you have a rainy season, you have a winter season. So for the contractor to work, there are different gears that they would need to have so that work doesn't get affected. So a delay can happen if the contractor's workforce or the contractor is not geared to provide this to the workforce or hasn't thought of providing this to the workforce and then runs around at the last minute because the people would need to be completely equipped for them to deliver a certain or specific activity or job. The subcontractor pass-through is 
primarily for a contractor to move in and out of the site where uh, Professor Matthew talked of the access. Uh, the contractor and the subcontractor that they end up employing need to have access to the site. They have to be given what we call certain passes which let them in and out seamlessly without any delay. Delay in getting the access or the pass through like we call is definitely going to have an impact on time because they work based on the shifts that or the number of hours that each person is allocated. There is also what is most uh, prevalent, the labor and material escalation that is there because if one does not foresee, for instance, a labor escalation can happen when a contractor is looking at people, skilled labor and workforce is completely different. Unskilled that they get from the local lay of the land may or may not be available based on let's say the festival seasons that are uh, that come through during the course of the contract because you may not get enough and more people so there is the labor escalation that also needs to be provided for because their contract the contractor needs to write this down very clearly in the scope of work while agreeing with the owner that there could be an escalation during uh, a, a period or specific periods during the course of the contract. And same is the case with the material escalation. We all know about uh, the fuel price escalation that is going on today. Now, let me take an analogy out of that. If you are a transporter today carrying material, running a fleet of trucks, carrying material from point A to point B. And if your diesel price started at 80 rupees and today it is touching close to 100, one needs to make sure because the operating costs determine how much of a margin or the lack thereof that you would be able to make. The op diesel constitutes close to 55 or 60 percent of the operating cost in a transport business. So one can very easily correlate this to, let's say, the two major commodities that end up getting uh, bought during the course of a civil contract is uh, steel and cement. So one needs to be very clear on how the words are put or how the contract is written in terms of escalation clauses so that it does it has no impact whatsoever on an increase in price or a decrease in price so it cuts both ways there is also if the if the owner and the contractor have agreed for accelerated construction uh, activities so if that is agreed upon because you typically what happens during the monsoons, there is not much of excavation activity that is done. So the pre monsoon excavation, the, the work uh, is accelerated so that the foundations are laid and work can be continued during, let's say, the monsoon period. What would happen during the monsoon if the excavation and the foundation is not done is the site being filled with water and you need to have some other equipment to keep pumping the water out and it ends up delaying or decelerating your construction activity. It could also happen that for the lack of labor and equipment on site, the contractors people are idling. Now, if the scope of work 
necessitates that the owner gets in the uh, not the labor but at least the equipment the material the non availability of material implies that the workforce that has come to do the work or the labor remains idle so there is that fixed element of the cost that would necessarily need to be paid or worked on depending on the uh, scope that the contract in which it's written as and finally we also talk of the productivity so if the productivity is linked in various ways one is to have a set of skilled and non skilled worker two is to have the labor that has the work protection also for the different seasons and three there would also need to be a continuous flow or stream of material because the lack of which would imply that the work goes in fits and bursts it stops starts stops starts and therefore there is a loss in productivity it's also important finally that you have the right type of insurance and uh, bonds now these are bank guarantees that are given because any project is time bound and if the project is not executed in time the principal or the uh, owner can enforce the bank guarantee to take some part of the contract value as a penalty to impose that as a penalty so this is also a part and parcel of the delayed damages that are on behalf of the contractor thank you sir which could be recoverable thank you sir now okay we will make this one on fast <clears throat> again this on the contractor delayed damages not recoverable depends on the contract language see this is what this is what sham has been trying to explain the contract language is something which is very very important so you have to envisage quite a number of things at the time of making the contract now one thing i would like to add here which has not been mentioned anywhere is now in my experience i always have the habit of incorporating in the contract another clause which is called escape clause or in a layman's language hardship clause now the explanation is as follows you have entered the contract as per prevailing circumstances and business environment at this point of time now while the contract is in force there can be issues or there can be circumstances or changes in the business environment which is beyond the control of the owner as well as the contractor in such instances let's say the contractor has got the right to revoke or reserve okay his objections and say i wish to revoke my right of reserve to bring it to your attention the changes in the circumstances okay like example a new policy is issued by the government okay now if i continue i will incur heavy loss so what i would like to do is i would like to take this opportunity to <clears throat> submit to your attention the additional cost which i will have to incur which was not which was not available at the time of contract negotiation so hence you know there will be a negotiation between the two people and then they agreed upon so the point what i am trying to say it's always essential to incorporate in any contract a escape clause or a hardship clause so whenever you confront situations like this you can utilize you can revoke the you know this particular clause for your own advantage okay both can do that the contractor as well as the owner right right then 
home office overheads, delay versus total suspension of work. Yeah, see, total suspension of work is something which is not imaginable. Okay, it it can happen due to circumstances beyond the control. Okay, it can be. Uh, okay, some of it are already included in the force measure, like a tsunami. Okay, a tempest. Okay, or an epidemic or any of such things. These are all included in the force measure as well. Lost opportunities, lost business revenue, lost bonding capacity. Okay, these are all things which can happen. Okay, and can delay the contract as such. Okay, legal and consultant fees. Okay, now here, this is a gray area. Okay, now when the contract was formulated, when the contract was initiated, yes, legal and consultation fees were both the parties incurred on it. Okay, in order to come up with a proper, a professional and workable contract. Okay, now if there is any changes in the contract, yes, again, <clears throat> you have to consult a, a legal counsel in order to look at the various issues which can come up or consequential losses which can come up. So it's essential that these things are not something which is recoverable from anybody. This is, you are trying to do all this in order to sustain your business. These are part and parcel of your Risk operation. Okay. Let me move on. Sham, you want to add on to anything? No, nothing, sir. Nothing right. is perfectly fine. Right. Thank Owner you. damages. Okay. <clears throat> Can I invite uh, Ram? <clears throat> this is these are your expertise. Liquidated damages. Ram, are you there? Yeah, so the contract would basically explain your deliverables and say that this would be the completion of the requirement in a certain date. So this example could be, as I said, dollar per day or dollar per unit of production lost. That would be a compensation, I mean, uh, uh, to be paid to the owner for failing in the deliverable. So this is basically an estimate of damages on what and legal terms it is treated as a estimate of damages and not a penalty and it you the contractor is liable to pay it. So he has to make sure. So just to give an example, suppose if I have I am a logistics company and I have to pay a liquidated damage of 5000 rupees per car production lost or 1 lakh rupees per day of production lost. Now, suppose I need to spend only 10,000 rupees by air freight and get the material so that I can avoid that claim. I would do that so that the production doesn't get affected. So, these are things which, you know, uh, people generally uh, use these urgent and air freight and other things. Similarly, you know, if I were, uh, I were a contractor in project, I would over time to people, I would make sure that people work and incur that extra cost over and above what I am eligible for, but I can avoid the claim. So these are calculations which a project manager would do at the contractor end so that they have to pay the owner damages. Yeah. So the actual, as far as owner's actual damages are, they are the lost See, There is from a, while the liquidated damage is a measure, the owner actually loses, you know, a lot more. It, he may lose a lot more because the, uh, in terms of business volumes, in terms of, there could be a brand value loss because of the, production being the products not being available on time you know the customer leading to customer dissatisfaction so there are various things in terms of lost revenue lost customer satisfaction then there is uh, you know the whole aspects of the project management has to be considered from the owner's perspective similarly while i you know i have to recast the drawing then i'll have to incur these additional costs 
and as and when the products projects get delayed there is escalation both on the material front and the labor front because the minimum wages are getting revised material costs are going up so these are things which the owners have to incur in case of damages and the liquidated damage is supposed to compensate for these damages so that the owner doesn't have a net outflow thank you ram <clears throat> yeah any questions any clarifications anyone please yeah construction managers cost in right, yeah. right requirements for a successful claim ram you want to take over yeah so as far as uh, see obviously any claim has to be uh, you know they have to make sure that it is dealt with properly so even if i am if i am eligible for a claim i have to pursue it in a proper way in a proper process so that i ultimately realize it it could be either party it could be the owner it could be the contractor but ultimately they have to make sure that they document things on time and raise these issues on time in a proper process so that the claim gets realized so the first thing would be the notice provisions so as soon as so the contract would mention the kind of notice which is normally required to register the claim typically it would be not more than 15 to 30 days after the incident of the claim so the so the person who is registering the claim has to make sure that they adhere to this notice period and they have to mention about all these details you know on the claim why the claim is being raised what is the reason and what are the what is the claim amount so similarly in, in case of other uh, you know proof of site access and other things there could be documentary i mean proof to ensure say that site access was given or not given so that all these claims can be properly documented and when the person processes the claim on the other side he has all the requisite information and can decide quickly so ultimately the success the uh, main aspect as far as these things are concerned is that it has to be clearly mentioned by the contractor that these claims have arisen because of other party if the owner is raising it it would be based on the what the contractor has not done and if the contractor is raising it it has to be based on what the owner has not done so the cause and the effect has to be clearly mentioned and with proper documentation right okay now can i move, let me move on to the next yeah. okay. okay right Uh, Shyam, you will be doing this. Or? Yeah, I don't mind. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, can anybody tell me who formulated? Is this is this diagram familiar? First of all, to anybody? MBA students, you already learned this. Okay, I'll give you a clue in your TQM, Total Quality Management. Okay. <clears throat> okay. This is a typical drawing of. It's called a fish bone analysis. What does it do? It lays down the problem that has been identified. it lays out the cause it identifies the key category or categories of causes that have led to the problem so first you end up by defining what is the problem that has been identified or you are trying to address do not get into the solution mode at that point in time just address and lay down the problem statement second you try to identify the key category of causes that could have led to the problem so in this example where it is an uncooperative branch office 
of a certain organization which is the uh, problem that has been identified let's say by the headquarters they came up with the probable categories of causes as it could be the site it could be that the tasks that they are performing the people are not you know commensurate they are not qualified to the task that they are performing the people themselves who have been chosen to do to do the task may not be well equipped to do the task the equipments that they have may not necessarily lead to the desired result of performing that task or the controls that they have or the controls that are being monitored are slightly loose or not very tight you know these are the four or five causes that they identified for the problem which they call as an uncooperative branch office so they have defined the problem statement which is an uncooperative branch office they have identified the key categories of causes which could have been the site the task being performed the people who are performing the task the controls are pretty loose not very tight there are no standard operating processes etc and the equipments with which they are being tasked to perform these activities may not be the best thank you sir once that is done sorry uh, professor just i want to just conclude by that once that is done then you figure out in each one of these categories what are the actual causes that have caused that have resulted in the downtime so that gets you the cause and effect analysis so you have the problem you have the probable cause you have the effect of those causes and now if you circle back it will be easier for you or for a project manager to come back and say if i address a i would get a better result in x or y professor all your sir thank you now comes contracted delay submission would you like to continue sham i let ram do this sir it's his sir okay. yeah so so this is the how a delay claim will be submitted by the contractor so he would when in the delay claim to be submitted by the contractor you would say why the owner is responsible for all the delays and what are the reasons what are the areas where the owner got delayed you would submit the schedule analysis on where the delay happened and then next point uh, professor just yeah and list out the damages as per the contract so there are so obviously the there would be clear transparency on the timings and the documentation would clearly state about you know how so for example if the contractor is submitting a delay on the owner not giving site access he can clearly prove that he could get site access only on a certain date and before that he the site access was not given to him so there would be sufficient documentary evidence for that similarly you know in terms of other aspects like design so there would be emails there would be letters written and there would be uh, you know formal communications exchanged on all these things so that those things have to be shared to make sure that and in some cases it could be photographs so where i have a clear timeline and condition of the status of the issue so that i have sufficient documentation and then that way i the authenticity of the claim gets established quicker and the processing is also faster for you to realize the claim <clears throat> thank you ram yeah right <clears throat> you want to continue ram yeah so on the owner side you know there are basically there are certain delays which are excusable non excusable so the excusable are the ones which are like what we call owner cost so if as we we have gone through the claims which can be owner cost we said about uh, site access it could be due to uh, item i mean the product 
uh, I mean, the product site not being in time. I mean, the soil and other issues. The drawings are not on. I have to be recast, or the product, the work itself. When you actually start doing it, there could be, uh, you know, the uh, there could have been an underestimate of the nature of the work and the time and the nature. So all these are owner cost, which can be, which have to be obviously proven, and it is compensatable by the owner to the contractor. As far as force major is concerned, this is something again, like for example, these are things which are beyond the, uh, you know, like. covid is one standard example of force major in recent times which nobody could foresee similarly it could be uh, so so these are areas where you don't have a proper insurance backup at the same time uh, you don't have a uh, you know the way to complete the contract so it is non compensatable now this is a matter of discussion because obviously if, as per the contract the Uh, items are not compensatable but the contractor may put up saying that hey from a long term relationship point of view i may have require so this is a matter of discussion but from a contractual perspective it is non compensatable ram i have a question for you yeah um, can the contractor if he has got a liability claim can he <clears throat> uh, apply in the liability claim apply in the under the liability insurance yeah yes yes so if uh, suppose if i have for example i could have a fidelity insurance to right. cover my certain things you know uh, in terms of certain pilferage theft so i can so there are insurance policies available uh, these are evolving and it is actually getting better where i can cover these risks partly right thank you let's move to the next one owners defense yeah so the owners are basically that these are all uh, you know if it is a concurrent delay caused by both the owner and the contractor where i uh, make sure i mean there is a, a fault on both sides in terms of thing then again it is non compensatable Right. Thank you. Right. Owners' defence again. Yeah. Yes, Ram. Yeah. So here, uh, when it comes to, uh, I think we have gone through the cause and effect analysis, where I review. So suppose if the owner has to put up a claim, they review the liability. they do the cost effect analysis they subject to the cost and effect analysis they review the damage find out the cost of the damage receipts invoices and ultimately raise the claim so the cost that are yeah so now the damages have can be these are damages which have to be paid by either party based on the cost effect analysis but there are other costs which people incur which is one is like suppose based on extension of the contract i can probably get some extra compensation so can you just uh, put the next uh, point yeah so see if there is a so while the contractor makes payment Uh, because of uh, has to make a payment for various liquidated damages he gets compensated for some extra change orders for the extended period of the contract similarly the owner gets compensated for the liquidate sorry the contractor gets compensated for owner's fault owner's right. damages is what we had said That's... but this gets partly compensated by the overheads which are uh, paid by him for extra change orders so that there is some so that there is an overall i can make up the loss partly so obviously there are pluses as well as minuses ultimately the idea is that it should be not a win lose situation but a win win situation in the final while both all everybody's interests are properly covered thank you ram yeah. 
Okay. <clears throat> Sham, you want to take over the counter claims? You, you are very good at it. Yeah, so the owner's damages and the counterclaims that can come, uh, it could be why the contractor is responsible for delays and liquidated or actual damages. So when there are these uh, on the site arguments going back and forth, there could be because if the contract is not watertight, if the contract is not, you know, uh, written in such a way that there are no gaps in place, one can maneuver to read the contract in the way that they want to uh, do it for themselves. So there is this scope and place where the contractor is held responsible for delays, or they could be slapped with these liquidated damages or the actual damages. Now, liquidated damages, let me also rush to say that they, if there is a contract value of 100, the liquidated damages cannot be equal to 100 or greater than 100. Then the contract does not hold any good. So there is always a cap to the LD that is placed. That is how any contract works. So for this to happen, there needs to be a clear schedule analysis on if you put a PERT or a Gantt chart, you need to have at this specific point in time, you should have completed this much activity. So there would be people from both sides to see what the schedules are they would analyze to see how much of the work has been done or and whether it is going on track or not. Next, they end up doing also the damage calculations. If while working on the site, there are some damages that are being done by the contractor. There is a subcontractor or an, uh, another contractor who there could be multiple contractors on site. Another contractor who's done something and there is a damage that has been caused by the work of a second contractor. The owner can and is liable to recover the damage based on the calculations that they make because they have lost both time as well as money in that instance. But for all this to happen, one needs to have subs but needs to substantiate with proper documents. So documentation is a must. We go back and circle again to the tender charter contract that we spoke of, that you have data, you have a repository of data, there is a knowledge bank, and documentation is of prime importance so that at the end of the day, there is nothing that falls between the cracks. Everything is crystal clear. It is black and white and no shades of gray. Thank you, Sean. Contractor's defense. So in the contractor's defense, it's purely the terms of the contract should be unambiguous completely. So Anything and everything that is required to perform the activity, drawings, plans, specifications, tolerances, everything should be available upfront before the work or the activity starts. The scope of work needs to be extremely well defined. Second, the change orders and the request for information that's there. The communication should be both ways. So if there is an additional element of work that needs to be done and therefore necessitates a change order because of more labor to be in place, extra material to be procured and got to convert for that activity, 
everything should be documented a, a schedule needs to be recast and the cost needs to be put up front so that at the end of the contractual period nobody is able to come back and say that this was not called for and finally when one does the schedule analysis one comes to see from the contractor's defense or the contractor's point of view what are the owner cost delays and it is listed down because the owner would have the contractor cost delays and what are the concurrent delays where both the parties mutually agree that we could not have moved forward because of the fault that arose in what both of us did. So those are those concurrent delays. The cost is the concurrent delays. Thank you, Sam. Right. Now we are moving on to what you have been looking for, the experiential learning lesson. OK, we're going to have a case study wherein a delay claim is the subject. OK, what we have been talking about. Once you see this, you will you can reinforce your knowledge as to what you have learned and what you have been hearing all these days. OK, so let's see what the case study is all about. The case study is about this. <clears throat> it's a story of a construction project that was planned to be completed in 34 months. Unfortunately, events happened and it was completed much later. Because of this, the contractor incurred extra cost and requested additional compensation from the owner. The following describes the process that was used to resolve the delay claim. OK, so now, um, <clears throat> yes, can we just move on to the case study? OK, how many participants have joined now? Madam, any more numbers have increased because I, I want everybody to understand and follow up this case study. How many more students have joined, dear? Uh, professor, we have three participants as of now. Oh, pardon me? Uh, we have three participants as of now. So there is no increase from the, from what we have seen in the beginning. OK, it's unfortunate. OK, right. So the case study we are going to see in two parts. One is the as planned schedule and number two is what was supposed to happen. OK, so you have two perspectives. OK, now, yes, <clears throat> I invite our panelist Ram, who is an expert in this field to take over as planned. <clears throat> Ram, you're on mute. Sorry, yeah. yeah. So uh, this uh, we briefly explained to you earlier about the PERT CPM charts. So this is a project activity planning where the project is about a construction project, which is a subway extension planning project. So it is a area where the there is a contractor who is tasked to complete this project. No, just go ahead earlier. Yeah. So there are nine activities. The first one is, uh, you know, that we have the mobilization of resources. The second so is to excavate soil excavation and sheeting. Then third is to erect the structural steel and I think the fourth is backfill and then the mechanical equipment usage. Then you have six and seven which can run simultaneously. So if you see six is not a critical activity because even if there is a slight delay in the gats, gates and cashier booths, it won't impact the final schedule. The elevator escalator, which is seven, is part of the critical plan. Power and lighting follows six. So six and eight are running parallelly to seven. And then nine is the finishing. So uh, this kind of gives the... Uh, total picture and if you see the thing on the top you have the 1 2 3 4 24 months starting from april may june to the march of the third year so there are obviously you know uh, time frames mentioned saying winter because each activity would have an impact based on the weather and other things so all this is highlighted in the 
basic activity planning chart. So this is a the planning as planned. Thank you. So right. the, this is the plan. What actually happened? Right. So what actually happened was the first activity got delayed by one month. The access was delayed. The person by the time they could uh, enter the site and mobilize their resources and equipment, the, they could not enter the site for one month. So they could actually enter the site only in May and then they were able to complete it by May end. Then what happened was they, when they started doing the excavation, they found that the soil conditions were different compared to what was earlier planned. So because of that, the entire process had to be, you know, the, uh, you had to recast the process and there was a further delay of two more months. So because the soil conditions were different, the conditions, the, there is again a designing difference which has to be done. So the entire project design had to be made different. The foundation part, the structural part had to be redesigned, which again called for a delay of two months. So after which the project, the structural activity was done, the construction was done, the equipment was also uh, Equipped uh, was, uh, you know, placed at the site. And finally, there was a, at the time of activity six, there was a public strike, you know, uh, it is akin to some activity which impacts everybody, both the owner as well as uh, the contractor, where they could not do the activity. So these things happen, couple of, you know, it could be, uh, for example, a strike at the port which is uh, actually outside the control of both the vendor, I mean, as well as the owner. So because there is a strike in the port, the materials which have arrived from abroad cannot be cleared and brought to the site. So there, those delays can impact. Similarly, there could be a transporter strike, which can again impact the uh, movement of products and delay the items. Or there could be a local disturbance within the city or state, which again could cause a delay. But the nature of the strike, which is mentioned in this case, is not is a public strike. It is not a local strike of the local manpower. It's not that the contractor manpower is going on strike because they want higher salaries. It is some kind of a public strike. Then you have the main activity seven where actually this is taken more, this is the productivity angle, where the productivity could not be achieved and one month, it could it took one month longer than required. And then there was a rework, which was there for another month. So these are the delays which happened. Ultimately, the total delay was eight months for the project. So instead of 24, the project actually took 32 months. So there is a delay, there is a time overrun of eight months. So this eight months, obviously it would have incurred, people would have incurred higher costs, both on the owner side as well as the contractor side. So a claim has to be registered and we need to analyze with a cost effect analysis to see what was the reasons for these six delays causing the eight month delay and how the claims will be raised and processed. Yeah. So this is a, again, a pictorial uh, chart, which actually shows the planned versus actual. Where we call, in another parlance, it's called as is versus to be, uh, I mean, actual versus planned versus actual. So, uh, planned versus actual here you have A is actual, P is the planned blue in blue and A is in black. So it again, it shows the delay and everything. Now it also, so if you see uh, in on May 1st, if you notice there is a new labor agreement which has come again because 
every year or at the end of every certain time period there is always a, the labor is eligible for a new agreement it could be because of increase in minimum wages statutory minimum wages or it could be based on other uh, governmental uh, factor i mean it could be based on market factors or you know these people could be part of a organization which gives increments every may so there is a new labor agreement so automatically as the project got delayed beyond month 25 higher costs were incurred automatically with higher wages after month 26 any questions at this side from um, anything to add professor mathews anything no no absolutely on right on the track let's see anything from the participant side or from the guests so actually just to recollect while this is a project kind of a scenario a similar concept will apply for other types of contracts now suppose you have a logistics contract for example a warehousing contract where 3pl so here i could have service level agreements for various key performance indicators it could be my uh, that is i should process the orders on time i should process i should receive the orders on time i should maintain all inventory Uh, properly you know there is a inventory custodian thing so again if the custo uh, the custodian of the inventory is with the third party the the inventory discrepancies become a claim for the owner against the contractor so like that so while these are activities the other contracts would be measured on slas for the claims it could be so in case of a logistic service the claim could be on inventory because i am a custody on this thing or because of service level agreements now typically service level agreements could be on speed as well as quality mostly it would be on speed where i make sure that i have to process the orders on time receive the orders on time make sure that i don't have claims enough claims on what are my dispatch which means that my dispatches are correct and my there could be certain slas on subjective slas like housekeeping that i am maintaining it cleanly and there is a evaluation done in a proper method so the claims could be based on those factors similarly if i am a transport contractor i may have a service level for transit time again on making sure that the products are delivered in good condition which is again a subjective factor where there is a judgment while it is subjective there it will be supported by photographs if there are any damaged items so that the claim is justified so in case of product it is purely on quality dimensions timeliness so again so just to summarize you could have different types of contracts this is a project contract with activities you could have a service contract like a logistic service provider with customer it could be a oem with a supplier who has to supply the product a certain product on time so that they make sure that the production doesn't stop so typically many oems have contracts with logistic service providers who say that they say that they have to have a make sure that they get the materials from all the vendors supply it to the production site but ensure that the production doesn't stop and if the production stops they are liable for a damage so this is where i mentioned a topic about you know where if i am finding that one material which is critical material is not available i may have to airlift it to make sure that the production line doesn't stop because that material is in a truck which has met with an accident en route but i cannot use that as a reason i have to make sure that the product is available so i have to airlift that stock and ensure that the other next truck is also dispatched immediately to avoid the claim so just to this is just to give a flavor that all these concepts can be applied for various types of contracts and this case is about a project and we will go with that more in detail but i just wanted to tell you that this there could be other types of claims other types of contracts but the same concept will apply thank you thank you ram let me let's move to the next one yeah because the project finished 8 months late Contractor submitted the following claim to the owner. Look at this. So 
so the contractor has submitted a claim saying that since there is a delay of 8 months i have a fixed overhead of my uh, equipment as well as labor so i have 50000 dollars to be paid per month so which is 400000 dollars then i have escalation after may 1st for all the labor due to the new agreement which is 5000 dollars then because of the redesign for 2 months my equipment were idle and i had to continuously pay the higher charges so that could be another 20000 dollars then because of the extra winter work after the contract so since the contract if we recall this go back uh, professor i can just illustrate the winter work yeah if you see uh, the yeah so if you see this winter 22 to 24 in the normal course it was only finishes whereas now they had to uh, do a lot more work in the actuals so in the planned it was only finishing whereas here they had to do both power and fighting as well as elevators so the work which was done in during winter was much more so which required higher cost yeah so because of that you have other 10 dollars then constructive acceleration where because i see constructive acceleration as shyam had mentioned was that i make sure that i provide some extra resources to accelerate the work so that ultimately this is on the advice of the owner that i make sure that i am able to fulfill the have a better timeline so but for that the extra cost has to be reimbursed by the owner then the lost productivity which is not due to contractor but because of adverse weather and out of sequence working is $10000 which they are attributing it to the owner related thing then there is a office overhead of another $20000 per month for 8 months so which is another 8 160000 Right. Consultant fees. One second, I am able to. Actually, I am not able to see that patch because there is some. Uh, so consultant. Uh, yes. Huh? Yeah. Can you yeah. see that? Yeah. Yeah. So consultant fees is uh, for claim preparation is fifty thousand dollars. Then interest on delayed payments based on because the payments were not. for this thing and typically the bank guarantee is given to uh, which is a bond you know for the contract by the vendor and basically it is to cover with that all these resources which are under their control it covers them and it is so some uh, so this because there is a 8 month delay extra interest of that 1 and 1/2 percent has to be paid which amounted to 10400 so totally the claim came up to 708724 so you have any comments on this claim that suppose if you were a owner and you have received this claim what would you what would be your first reaction yeah let's see from the participants as well as from the guests what is your point of view <clears throat> yeah anybody Let us say that you were the cap of the owner. Can we have a, a session now? <clears throat> Two sides looking at the final claim. Or Anybody? let me put it another way, uh, Professor Matthew and uh, Ram. Yeah. As an owner, yeah. once the contractor, I mean, he's done his detailed homework and he is given a claim. of 700000 plus dollars so as an owner would you say yes mr contractor you are perfectly fine uh here is your check for these additional expenses that you have borne would you do that or would you do something that is different or will you take it to the court or you go for legal counsel Hello. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Nitesh. You are audible. 
yeah so initially we would have a chat about this what is the implications of the contract being delayed and uh, typically analyze what is the condition present so then we would come to a conclusion whether you could go to that extent of uh, extending the project and uh, making sure it is done at the earliest so that would be my initial thoughts no no here nitesh the project is already completed it's 8 months delayed and everything is done okay so now it is the costs have been incurred by either party based on but nobody delayed the project because this claim is pending it has been completed now after the completion of the project the contractor has raised this claim so you would uh, go back to the basics right sir so yeah you so would... now as a owner how you would process this claim would you be liable to pay this 708000 or how would you discuss it again it is not based on that i am a powerful man or you are a powerful man but based on the contract what they have signed and what is the cost effect relationship the owner problem versus the contractor problem the what we discussed in the during the you know today's session how would you analyze these delays and say which of these delays can be attributed because it is due to the owners issue and others which could be related to the contractors issues so if it is a contractor issue i mean the contractor is really not eligible to ask for the compensation he is eligible to ask for the claim only if it is a owner related delay if the delay has happened because of the contractor then he is not he won't be able to ask so that is the idea so if the owner says if it is due to me i am liable to pay but if it is happened due to the contractor then so the idea is to analyze these delays as you rightly said but you have to the project is completed but how would you analyze these delays so depending on the implications which has been caused so you would analyze from the owner end so you would the owner has to take a liability for that as you rightly mentioned if it's the owner's issue so otherwise it's the contractor's issue it, it is purely dependent on him so because of on his side so typically you wouldn't uh, as a contractor you wouldn't uh, raise the charges which has been caused by the delay so if it's a owner's issue you would you could request depending on the contract being signed and the terms and conditions which is there is it right to say that you will do a cost and effect analysis the yes sir so okay. so you go back to the fish bone diagram that we saw the root yes, cause analysis so the problem statement here is 708000 dollars that needs to be forked out this is the problem statement facing the owner oh is mohan rao among the participants today he is not there sir today i see uh, professor we have only dikshikup and uh, we have nitish uh, okay. dr paul was there but uh, i guess something came up so she had to peel away in the and uh, madam sabita is also there ms sabita yeah anyway so you have a problem statement now from the uh, fishbone analysis which says that there is a claim staring at you of 708724 dollars so as we spoke of the problem statement that becomes uh, i mean you need to unravel it what are the causes and effects and what were the effects that led to these causes and once you get to those effects and figure out the nature of the effects then you would be easily able to correlate them with the scope of work where certain things are attributable to the contractor certain things to the owner okay so can we move to the next slide absolutely absolutely sir right so before analyzing the contractor's cost the owner performed a delay responsibility analysis as follows so always remember 
when you are faced with a situation like what <clears throat> Ram and Sham has explained, it's absolutely essential. You have to do a delay responsibility analysis, like plus the cause and effect analysis. Okay, both come in the same. Okay, but that is a way to do it, things professionally. Right. So let's look at delays. Ram. So uh, the delays, I think we have specifically said, access delay is one month, differing site condition is two months, redesign delay is two months, strike is one month, rework is one month. And of course, lack of progress, one month it took longer than planned. So these are, so totally you have one plus two, three plus two, five plus six, seven plus one, eight. These eight. are the delays. Yeah. All right. Right. This summarizes the total delay responsibility analysis. Okay. Just go through it. Does uh, anybody has got any difference of opinion on this? Okay. Look at strike. Okay. We have been talking about strike. So strike is attributed to neither party. Okay. Now there are three cases where it is attributed to the owner and two to the contractor side. Now, Ram, from your experience, do you think the owners, let's say it's a project in India, do you think the owners in India will accept their own faults? What is yeah. your opinion? So, see, typically, uh, you know, getting to uh, make Payments, extra payments from principals, you know, would be a definitely a, a challenge. A yeah, a it challenge. would be a challenge. So, what the owner would typically, while of course, classically, as per, see, typically they may not sign such contracts where they agree to make compensation for delays also. But what they may say is that they may absorb, suppose they may absolve them. Because certain delays happen from their side and certain delays happen from because of them, they may try and negotiate and say, hey, I mean, I won't ask you this, you won't ask me this. So I will try and compensate you somewhere else. So what you're saying else. is so they will absorb liability. Liability. They may write off certain liabilities. They write off the liability yeah. Part. Yeah. But, okay, let's look at a uh, worst scenario. How about if the contractor takes him to the court, it can further delay the final settlement. Correct? Yes, yes. So these typically, you know, contractors also don't take the principal to court for small amounts because ultimately, you know, uh, they are also, you know, our legal system is not very quick, you know, in terms of dispensing justice and ultimately getting the money. So people definitely prefer the option of negotiation and settlement, you know, one time uh, or to an arbitrator. You know, the yeah, arbitrator right. part is okay because you, you talk to a third party and there is a legal provision for it in the agreement itself. So they would ultimately, the approach would be to try and sort it out right away or if there is really no solution possible, in the internal discussions, go to an arbitrator. The court part of it, you know, in the Indian conditions would be a last resort where the amount involved is very high and the points of disagreement are very huge and mm -hmm. is irreconcilable, you know. So that would be the reason and nature why you would go to court. Typically, uh, you know, uh, it is not, a, it is a last resort where, you know, the agreement is really not forthcoming. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move on. Yeah. Okay. So, as I think, uh, if any people have comments, you can say. See, the access delay is obviously it is completely the responsibility of the owner. So they are eligible for that one month. Differing site conditions and soil conditions again is the responsibility of the owner. Redesign and designing which causes delay in the equipment and other things, that is again owner. 
strike as i had briefly mentioned it is a public strike you know so there is a strike which is due to the port or transportation strike so here it is not responsibility of either person so uh, it would be uh, you know people cannot ask for uh, compensation it would be a you know a business cost but the lack of progress and rework these are two things where definitely it is due to the contractor right because the productivity was a problem which caused the lack of progress and reworking is essentially that i have to rework hello yeah sorry yeah, you, you know yeah so the rework is again the responsibility of the contractor because they uh, he had to the quality was not good enough and they had to allocate resources to do it again so that is again so these two are definitely contractor issues for which they are not eligible for compensation they are eligible for the first three reasons right sir uh, i have a yeah. question go ahead sir once the, uh, the rework is initiated by the owner since uh, uh, he is not happy with the work being done so would it be considered as an owner issue or would it be the yeah. contract see nitesh as far as rework it is based on actual agreed quality okay so the terms of the quality would be agreed as far as the so suppose if i am uh, doing a work i have to agree on a certain set of quality parameters while doing the work now if the final product is not as per that quality then the owner is within his rights to say that hey i need to get the work done but it has it has to be done with the quality i want so the rework becomes this thing now yes you are right that while the owner has asked to do it it is also because the earlier product was not as per the quality agreed in the contract now certain areas become subjective you know where i could differ in the point of view that hey it is actually okay so we we'll have to have make sure that as many objective measures are there so that there is no dispute See, there should be as many objective measures to say that the final product is acceptable or not so there should not be a uh, two opinions on that ultimately based on these objective measures whether the product is acceptable or not so that should be the endeavor of the parties to make sure that it is not subjective it should be objective and they then the and in a true professional spirit the rework is done by the contractor to make sure that the quality is as per the agreed quality yes Thank so there is a trade off also so whenever there is a contract sign uh when you say or oh no when you say trade off what does it mean sir uh, uh, the quality of the materials being uh, applied or uh, yeah so the contract was so, the product quality right. of final output correct right. so you are see in this case the material also was is if it is the responsibility of the contractor typically you know you know in any construction work the people don't supply the cement and uh, steel and ask them to do the just the labor job the contractor yes. procures the cement steel and all the mud and other items and does it now suppose he can prove it to the steel person that this defect is because of the defective steel he can claim it from his supplier and say you supply me the steel free of cost he can do that okay but it would the main owner is still eligible to get this from the contractor right so yes suppose if i am as a owner having a contract where i supply the material and i am having only a labor contract then what you are saying is correct that the, if the material is of defective quality then the contractor can say that hey it is not because of me but it is because of the material but increasingly companies frame contracts where the accountability and the you know uh, analysis is easy they don't uh, have too many you know uh, players which can cause confusion in doing the analysis responsibility analysis right sir Understood. typically it would be an all inclusive contract correct correct let's move to the next one yeah right <clears throat> this is again the delay responsibility analysis yeah it's a very well depicted diagram 
So it's as we mentioned very clearly, the first three reasons accounted for five months. The neither is one month, and the contractor one is two months. So this is the ultimate delay responsibility, where it is five to one out of the eight months. So logically, I think the owner can say that they can they are liable only for the cost incurred for these five months. And not for the entire eight months. Right. Can there be a compromise formula? Because if the owner is responsible for five months, the contractor is for two. When they come to the final settlement, five minus two, it's three. Yes. They ultimately it is the see while there is a contract, it is a it is a starting basis for a discussion. Mm. you know uh, so uh, the contract definitely specifies the terms and conditions which are uh, at the beginning and then the attempt is to say that hey you fix the responsibility and do the calculations but after the calculations are done you know ultimately you know there is a discussion now there is a practical issue that you know you have a you know for example if you have a contractor now he is actually doing it for a he is procuring all the materials he is procuring the labor and he is adding a profit which is not which is going to be only portion of the total contract cost right now typically contracts have that you know the maximum limit which they can deduct from the contractor should be only a certain limit of this particular profitability and you know it could be okay it could be based on the percentage of total value suppose i know that the profit is 10% i could say that the maximum deduction can be to the extent of 3 to 5% or i could actually say that you know there could be a cost plus where i know this is the management fee or this is my profit and i say so that you know ultimately it doesn't happen that over and above all the material labor everything the contractor also lands up paying for extra amount for all these penalties which is obviously not viable so most uh, companies have a limit on these damages which ensures that which is linked to the profit of the contractor because that is really what what he can afford he cannot afford the suppose if i am having a 1 crore contract but my profitability is 10 lakhs but the claim is 20 lakhs then it is obviously not viable so mm -hmm. my deduction will be out of these 10 lakhs so there is definitely will be a discussion and in many contracts they do have a limit which is mentioned for the uh, these deductions which can happen to the contractor thank you upper limit, upper limit yeah right based on the delay responsibility analysis the owner appointed the contractor's claim cost and estimated the contractor's entitlement to additional compensation as follows okay <clears throat> right contractors claim and owners claim okay ram i leave it to you yeah so this is where i think we discussed about the first line is instead of 8 months is allowed to charge only for 5 months which is the owner delay so instead of 400 it becomes 250 the labor escalation is apportioned again in the same 5 by 8 ratio to make it 3125 because the delay only 5 months delay is because of the thing so the escalation is also given in the same proportion ideal equipment is fully sanctioned because definitely you know i in typically in project sites when i hire the equipment they are lying idle but i have to continuously pay my hire charges to the owner or i incur some depreciation based on my if i am the owner of the item so i am eligible for that winter work is definitely definitely as these five months have been delayed because of the thing and winter was somewhere close to the end of the contract the entire 10000 has been given constructive acceleration here there was a negotiation out of this 10000 dollars uh, where the owner had asked them to accelerate certain items and uh, based on which the contractor had claimed 10000 dollars but uh, the owner was able to convince the contractor saying that part of this is not due to my this project of acceleration so only 7500 was passed 
now uh, the last productivity is something which is uh, uh, you know uh, this is causation was not shown you know so it was uh, not shown so you know the, it was not passed in the home office overheads again it was uh, no, the work was not suspended so because of that since there is only delay and there is no this thing again they did not approve this extra cost consultant fees again was not approved because it was not considered as i mean consultant fees is something which people have to do it as part of their work so they cannot claim it separately so you know there is a uh, thing then bond they again the substantiated cost they have agreed for part of the amount just like the escalation labor escalation they have agreed for uh, part of it so the total instead of 708 724 came to only 294 900 out of which they agreed they have they were liable for two months of liquidated damage of 500 dollars per day so that two months thing was minus here so 30000 dollars was minus and Two sixty-four thousand dollars were given as a entitlement. So that is the claim. Now it is not just to say that this two sixty-four was fully paid by the owner. I again, it would again call for a discussion because the owner himself is running a business, and it is a certain percentage of you know he would be having a budget to do that, and so he would again you know these costs may have some buffer you know from. Uh, the claim point of view so there could be some reduction possible from the contractor side so the attempt would be to make it a see anything which is paid over and above or as a damage definitely there is a lot of negotiation because it is really not see it is uh, true for anything you know suppose you take up a house on rent and you want to do something uh, something extra is asked you would definitely discuss you know you wouldn't like to just pay it just like that so it is true for anything that over and above anything anything extra you do have a discussion and it is uh, ultimately the idea is that this gives a framework while the final thing would be based on there could be the softer aspect of relationship future projects other projects happening at the same time exactly you know, there are so many considerations which are uh, done while ultimately finalizing the claim value Add, uh, Professor, uh, Shyam. No, I think uh, you have no, given absolute uh, explanations given. Right. Um, it's, we are only sad that there aren't very many participants. That's the only correct worry. What we have. Okay, let's just come to the conclusion now. Today being the la the last day, certain formalities we have to complete. Um, the contractor requested more than seven hundred thousand. We know it. Okay. And then the owner estimated the contractor was entitled approximately two hundred and sixty thousand. So it has to be agreed something in between. So they negotiated a settlement somewhere in between. So that's where, okay. And everyone lived happily ever after, if you believe so. <laughs> okay. So we have come to the yeah. end. happy ending is very important. Finally. Because yes, for the sake true. of business continuity. Correct. True. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we have come to the end of the session for today, as well as for our six days of the webinar comes to an end. So thank God for the weather conditions um, to start with, and for all the help what has been provided by SBM University and my colleagues. Um, Okay, so the the floor is open for any discussion whatsoever. And in the meantime, uh, okay, please bear with us. We would like all of you to fill the feedback form. Whoever is available, as including guests. Uh, for the information of the participants, uh, this feedback form will be reaching you in a couple of minutes uh, from the side of the ASBM. It's a simple uh, Google-based form. Uh, with a couple of questions, you can uh, just fill in as per your user experience. Thank you. Um, Tiar, can you make sure 
the <clears throat> the feedback form is sent to other participants who have not also. been here today. Correct. Uh, yes, sir. It will be sent uh, to ASB, and since they have the entire master list of all the uh, attendees, uh, they will be distributing it. Right. Please do that. Just a couple of minutes from now. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Question house is open. Anybody has any queries? Uh, you can please give a shout. Okay. Uh, TR, has the form been circulated? TR, the form, the feedback form has been circulated or given to Madam to circulate. If I understood him right, uh, Professor, he said it is going to reach Madam in a couple of minutes. So yeah, that she could circulate. Correct. That's correct, Chuck. It's going to reach in uh, in a minute. Uh, it has just come and uh, I'm sending it across to ASBM. They will be circulating it now. Just, okay. Just. Yeah, at least uh, let's get it from the people who are participating now. Okay, others, you can send it. It has later. a link. Uh, it has a link and that link, anybody, anybody who has that link can access that form. I'm sending it to his book as we speak. <clears throat> Shyam, you want to add anything uh, as, a, as a final word to the participants as well as to the guests? Uh, nothing uh, specific, but uh, only to say, first of all, thank you to ASBM for uh, hosting this entire session on contract administration management and the various topics. And uh, uh, we enjoyed, in fact, uh, I can speak for myself, but uh, I can definitely vouch for my other colleagues also, definitely, Professor Matthew. Uh, Mr. Ram Kumar, Mr. Yogesh Kundra also that we enjoyed delivering the sessions uh, with the intent to uh, primarily provide to you not only the contextual and textbook or academic practice, but also intersperse it with real life experiences because uh, quite a few of you, uh, quite a few of us come with a lot of industry background also where uh, we have seen uh, practices such as these which are written in the books being carried out in principle. So I do hope that the participants, though they may be uh, a very few number today, uh, that all of them who had joined earlier also enjoyed the uh, sessions as much as we did in delivering them. Thank you, Thank Shyam. You. Ram, you want to add? Uh, no, nothing more. I think Shyam has really covered uh, everything. Yes, we, as uh, we said, we liked doing it as a, I think uh, we have to also thank Professor Matthews for I mean, kind of uh, devising this idea of collaborative this thing so that absolutely, you know, yeah. Together Sorry, I forgot that. that. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is something good. I mean, it really we are able to complement each other and deliver, and we hope that the audience realize that the sum of three was really more than the whole. Perfect. Very well said, Ram. Thank, Thank you. It's Thank really, you. really good. Yeah. So may okay. I add two points? Yeah, please. So I thank uh, Professor Matthew sir and uh, Shyam sir and as well as Ram Kumar sir today for joining and uh, giving an experiential learning for us all of us. So the few of us were uh, present in the meeting. So it was very uh, heartwarming to get those many aspects and perspectives in within a contract and how do you handle and uh, how do you handle those elements and how do you uh, make sure the 
contract is being held withheld and even if we have implications how do you resolve that so there these are uh, huge uh, topics and uh, i would uh, definitely take it forward in my career as well so a uh, very thank you to airbm also in uh, smooth conduct of this uh, six days of uh, webinars thank you everyone thank you thank you anybody from the guests madam <clears throat> now it's your turn I'm not able to hear you. Not able to hear you, madam. Hello. May I audible now, sir? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, sir. I was just I have just sent the feedback form to the, all the participants. Uh, yeah. Those participants who are present over here, please uh, fill it up. It has uh, just been sent to uh, all the participants. please uh, feel free to uh, fill the form so that uh, uh, we can uh, actually do the improvement what are the things needed and um, from my side uh, it was really an enlightening session sir what uh, i was teaching for all this days for 15 to 16 years i am into this profession but in this so six days uh, whatever i have learned practically and especially the experiential learning sessions were excellent i learned a lot sir and uh, uh, it was uh, like and uh, one more thing i learned to be like how time management is done actually by all the dignitaries like you of yoga is uh, uh, so uh, i have learned uh, so much from you so now i request uh, professor pratap pati to give the formal um, board of thanks uh, before uh, that uh, so after that we will go for the formal photo session and uh, so i request um, professor pratap pati to um, propose the board of thanks sir are you there can you switch on your video please sir thank you thank you madam good to see you sir good to see you so uh, finally uh, in city is a very short term course within 6 days uh, we have finished such a huge topic like contract administration Uh, which is actually not feasible uh, to complete all these things within the six days. But uh, uh, though again, uh, we may uh, we request the team, the Bhatti team, to conduct this type of program once again because uh, some of the participants from Tata Steel they could not able to attend because of their uh, hectic schedule as well as uh, they are also attending some other online programs. So all these types of things. are there and also i could not able to attend uh, uh, means actively because of my health issues Excellent. so uh, madam has uh, has mentioned that uh, he she left uh, for today due to some work uh, our paul uh, madam <coughs> sarath kaul madam um, so i am very much thankful to all the team members from gatti intellect systems captain yogesh kanda and the president of bhatti intellect solutions and also i am very much thankful to professor pj mathews from the initial days he is very closely associated uh, with us and also starting from the designing of the brochure and uh, program formulation all these things uh, mathews sir has helped us and uh, uh, he guided us so i am very much thankful to professor pj mathews and all the team members mr sam ramurthy who is the vice president and uh, sir has also taught many sessions then mr ram kumar subramanyam sir sir is the vice president in gatti intellect systems and uh, sir has also taught lot many things in today's session also again captain rajesh sharma ji i am very much thankful to you as a deputy director of training then krishna kant sir admin executive from gatintelec then uh, balakrishna sir it executive 
from Gatti. Then last but not the least, Trilotan Rag, uh, who is very actively associated with us uh, in all the technical coordination as well as uh, in the academy side, Sir has uh, helped us a lot. Then I am very much thankful to our uh, Honorable President of ASBM University, Mrs. Jit Patnak sir, and uh, I am also very much thankful to our uh, Vice Chancellor, Dr. Kalyan Shankar Rai, for his support and uh, constant inspiration to us. <clears throat> then I am also very much thankful to our Pro Vice Chancellor, Algu Madam, for his uh, constant support and inspiration. So though they are also busy in the admission aspect in the time period is particularly for admission in our university. So though they could not able to participate in this particular program, but uh, they constantly support us, encourage us to conduct these type of programs. Every year we conduct these type of programs, but uh, uh, day, day by day, what we see that uh, lot many participants, they give interest for this type of programs, they try to participate in this type of programs from industries. Those who are having um, not many years of experience. So this is a good thing. And also I think uh, there is a good knowledge sharing from the participant side, as well as from the resource person side, which is required in the uh, academic process. I think uh, if such type of programs should be conducted, then definitely it will help as a teaching fraternity to all of us. So thank you, thank you again to our uh, IT team, particularly all the persons who from our university side who helped us in conducting this program, starting from the link creation, link sharing, and all these activities. And I think whatever uh, thing we have missed, like uh, sending of any materials to the participants, that uh, will be delivered to the participants as soon as possible. We tried our best. But again, there are some technical issues are also there because of online programs. But again, we have uh, managed it, I think. So all the resource persons will be in touch and uh, we can share their email ID because the participants, if they want to ask any queries, they can ask them. So again, sir, thank you all for your uh, constant support and uh, uh, taking the lengthy session around two and a half hours every day, almost three hour session at this uh, particular uh, time duration. We have taken all the classes regularly. So thank you again, sir. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> thank you, Professor Padav, for the word of thanks. What I would like to say on behalf of my colleagues as well as from Gatti, Gatti Intellect is we do appreciate um, collaborating with ASBM University to conduct this course, especially a course like this. What we would strongly suggest because of the contents and the focus required, it should be a continuous, pro, a continuous three day sessions because uh, that's what the subject is. See, in my career, I've been teaching this subject all you know at least minimum three days then the interaction is much more then the focus is much more because here i'm sure my colleagues will agree see it's a it's a subject which has to be consumed okay digested synthesized and then you know see there has to be proper interaction now can you believe it uh, professor Pati? we have every day one and a half to two hours session among ourselves we do interact because it's a you know it's a subject which has got a lot of interpretation connotations so it has to be ironed out properly so that's why you know, what we are suggesting is you know this is a subject you know see i've taught so many times the same subject online okay as long as the participants are from the industry and they are knowledgeable you know the the session goes and the participation level increases tremendously Okay, and people will be delighted. See, after every session, we'll give five to 10 minutes rest. Got it? So it's not that they're going to get bogged up for the whole day. It will be a minimum five, five, seven, five hours per day. So please 
take that into consideration because um, <clears throat> Sham, don't you feel the same? I think you're I'm, mute. I'm sorry, sir. Absolutely, because uh, uh, first and foremost, the collaborative uh, efforts between uh, people at Gati uh, requires uh, you know, they say it ha it needs to be done in concert. So one, we plan our day in such a way that we go through the entire session and whoever is best suited to do a certain activity or a topic takes that over. That's one. So that it is seamless at the time when we are in front of you and we are talking to the audience at large. Uh, and secondly, yes, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to have uh, people, one, the students asking and during some of the sessions, really probing questions, one, two, uh, also that two and a half to three hours in a day may not do justice. I don't know if I'm going beyond what I'm saying, but you know, sessions like these should be done in quick succession with breaks of 15 minutes or 20 minutes so that it remains well within the grasp of the student as they move along or as the course continues, courseware continues. Okay, Ram, you want to add anything to Professor Pati? Uh yeah, no, nothing in specific. I think I have really mentioned whatever and Sham and both of you have covered. Uh, so uh, definitely, I think we will also like to get a specific feedback on how the, what, whether they want to add certain elements or delete certain elements. Maybe we could incorporate that in our plan next time. So. Uh, one thing more what we can add is, uh, which I did not mention earlier, that when you have a full day session, we can do case studies as well. Absolutely. Absolutely right, sir. Okay. And the discussions can be much more, uh, you know, intensive. Mm. Here, you know, within a two and a half hours time, you know, it's impossible. On the first day, um, Professor uh, Saroj Kaul made a mention about saying that, you know, um, the handouts to be provided. So I told madam, we would definitely like to do that. But the challenge is within two and a half hours time, it's not easy to provide our PowerPoint well in advance, nor any inner reading materials or case study. Understand? We like to definitely do it. And that's the way of teaching, okay? Um, these sort of subjects, but the time has to be, you know, that's why we said full day then a lot of things can be done. It can be made much more interesting. And like what you have said, if you're looking for a Tata Steel, definitely we would like to do it. Please think about three day full days. We would love to do it. Like, I, I don't know whether you were there. I belong to XLRI. So Tata Steel is, is very much uh, in my heart. Because I've been taught by several of the senior uh, executive senior managers from Tata Steel. Good. Uh, right, uh, madam, has the feedback been uh, circulated and uh, given to everyone? Uh, it has been circulated, sir. It has uh, uh, had already circulated, sir. Right. Okay. That's that's correct. Right. Okay. Tr, you want to add anything more? Uh, except my <laughs> gratitude uh, to ASBM and the team and to all of you for the session. Uh, nothing in particular, sir. Uh, Professor Pati, I wish you a very uh, speedy and uh, uh, full recovery. I hope uh, we will to see you sometime in the future in person. As they say in Urdu, inshallah. So look forward to that. Um, as far as uh, the uh, photographs are concerned, if uh, the participants uh, we have the chance to. Yeah, I. Them. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. They, they don't, seem, they don't seem to be here, so if they can turn on their uh, uh, cameras, I could just take a snapshot, if possible, please. Uh, 
Okay, I request uh, all the participants to sit on the video. I would uh, just reiterate the request. If we can, every, everyone can switch on the cameras. Uh, we'll just take a snapshot. All the participants, please. Right. Good to see you, Nitish. To forgive my uh, unfamiliarity with MST per se. Uh, so uh, our, uh, sir, our IT, IT cell has already taken the screen. Okay. Because I was not okay. able to scroll through all the, uh, the thumbnails. So. Yes, sir, please, sir. Uh, I was saying that I was not able to scroll through all the uh, thumbnails of the videos. So, uh, Mr. Sethi, I think uh, we'll be able to do it. Ah, he has done, sir. He has done. He has taken all. Jolly good. Jolly good. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much. Okay. So, madam, uh, Ken, you are the right person to conclude the um, session. <coughs> so, Professor Pratap, wishing you a very speedy recovery. Thank you, sir. Thank you all for your good wishes. Thank you. Yes, madam, over to you. Sir, sir, coming in contact with uh, all you people, it was really very nice, sir. And uh, I learned a lot. And uh, uh, whatever point, if any problem has happened from our side, like. No, uh, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> so I beg your pardon for that. No. Uh, if I, may say, <laughs> echo, I would like to echo what the professor was mentioning. Uh, you've been a wonderful source of support. And so quick and uh, proactive. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's my, my pleasure, sir. Uh, okay, I enjoy doing all of the things and uh, looking forward for more sessions like this. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you, all. So much. Thank you very much. So much. Thank you. Thank you. I think Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasant weekend. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.